This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. On behalf of uh, the Division of Social Sciences and also our uh, co-sponsors, the UCSD Alumni Association and the Helen Edison Lecture Series, I'm delighted to welcome you to this event this evening. Uh, this will be a panel discussion that features four faculty experts from UCSD who will address the question, California in crisis, what went wrong, and how can it be fixed? As you may know, or you may not, University of California was founded in the 1860s as a land-grant college under the Morrill Act, um, and, and as such, it took on a public service mission of education and research for the state. Uh, it's a mission that we take very seriously. And today, as, as society in general and the state of California in particular face issues and challenges of tremendous complexity and enormous social consequence, um, we think that fulfilling that obligation is more important than ever. And that is the reason why we've staged this evening's event. California as a state has occupied an interesting and possibly unique role in the history of our country. Uh, it was the westward magnet that pulled pioneers, visionaries, uh, and not a few kooks um, to the west coast. As a child growing up in Los Angeles in the 1960s, I remember being very proud of being a Californian. Uh, this was the place where the future was happening now. Uh, it was a place that was the trend and the pace setter for the rest of the country. We had the Beach Boys, the Mamas and the Papas. Uh, it seemed that everybody was singing our song. Today, we hopefully still have a lot of that pride, but it's a pride that's a bit frayed at the edges. Our public education system, which was once universally claimed to be the best in the country, is now in a state where teachers are being fired, schools are being closed, and much is in disrepair. We can't pay for a number of social services that were at one point the hallmark, the signature of the state. State government seems tied up in knots. Our constitution is a chaotic collection of regulations and policies that are often in conflict. We, what went wrong is the question, and can it be fixed, I think, the more pressing one. These are questions that we think are on everybody's minds right now. There are also questions that we as social scientists care about a lot. Um, we don't think it is the responsibility of social scientists to provide the answers. That's for the voters of the state. But we do think that we have an opportunity and an obligation to try to help clarify what the issues are, what the problems are, and possibly present options uh, for the public to decide. The University of California is, by virtually every measure, the best public university system in the world. And so we think that we have an opportunity to help contribute to the public discussion about the future of the state. The panel tonight is really offered very much in that spirit of land-grant institution uh, in service to the people of California. Tonight, we'll hear from four faculty uh, from UCSD. Uh, they'll talk about a set of interrelated issues. Uh, Thad Kauser from the Department of Political Science will talk about the dynamics and the dysfunctions of California state government. Please to welcome Thad. California's fiscal problems have been a long time coming, but they crystallized almost exactly a year ago with uh, the May 19, 2009 special election. So this was an election where the governor and the legislature put on the ballot a series of, of spending cuts, tax increases, and constitutional amendments that voters on both sides of the aisle found some degree about. They overwhelmingly rejected every portion of, of this deal that came out of Sacramento. And, and that defeat in that election almost a year ago led to, to the calls, the characterization of California as, as a potential America's first failed state. But May 19th also posed a paradox, because does anyone happen to know where Governor Schwarzenegger was that day? He actually wasn't in Sacramento, weeping over the, the ballot uh, election news. He was in Washington, D.C. He was in the Rose Garden, I think, uh, watching President Obama grant an exemption for California's landmark global climate change bill. And President Obama called our bill the, the national model 
for what's perhaps the most pressing policy challenge of our generation. And that wasn't California's only policy victory last year. In, in November, the governor and legislature came together again and, and passed a, a package of, of water bills. There were major changes that really resolved this, this log jam and water policy that's existed for, for about 30 years in California. So the, the paradox of, of May 19 is how can the same system that's produced budget gridlock year after year also be producing innovative, cutting edge policy at the same time? And I'm going to argue right now that, that, that we need to, that California really has, has two governmental systems. And we need to look at them separately, evaluate them differently, and, and reform them in, in different ways if we're going to make this moment of constitutional reform in California work. If we're going to fix the problems in California uh, while building on, on the parts, the strengths of California government. And so our two systems are this. We have a legislative bill writing system that works on majoritarian principles. Things pass in the, in the legislature with, with the majority vote. And, and this allows uh, the legislature to, to, to get around gridlock, to move policy, but sometimes it moves too quickly and too far. By contrast, we have a budget writing process. And this is governed by super majoritarian rules. It takes two thirds of the vote in the legislature to, to pass a spending plan for California. This grants the minority party a, a voice in California government, but it also slows things down and leads to gridlock year after year. And, and so what I want to do is, is bring in s some data to evaluate both of these processes and, and come up with some proposed solutions that, that build on their, their strengths and try to counteract their weaknesses. And, and all this data is coming from a, a collaborative of, uh, of researchers who have been deeply engaged in California Constitution this year. So folks from UC San Diego, Stanford, Berkeley, and Sacramento State have had a series of conferences, have, have brought together the, the cutting edge researchers from across the country on, on California's constitutional dilemma. Uh, and, and we've tried to put the research of scholars in, in the, at the fingertips of voters who have in their hands the power to change California's constitution. Because the only way you can change the constitution is with a majority vote of the people. And, and so one of the things that we've done is created a website. CaliforniaChoices.org, which we're officially launching on Thursday at Cal State LA, but you can go to now. And this website provides a lot of information about reform, but the timely thing it provides is information about all those ballot measures that are on your June ballot. So you can read pro cons, find out who's funding these, find out who's endorsed these, and come up with your own voting suggestions and email them to all your friends if you go to CaliforniaChoices.org. So this is part of what UCSD and other research centers have been doing. So, so let me start the evaluation of California government by talking about the, the context in which we're operating. Because uh, what's changed, the reason why we're talking about constitutional crisis today and not five years ago or 20 years ago when we were governed by basically the same rules, the reason is twofold. And the first thing is, is partisan polarization. So you may have heard this word, and what this means basically is that the average Democrat and the average Republican in Sacramento in, the, in our state legislature have grown further and further apart on the ideological spectrum. And that means coming together to agree on something gets harder and harder. This is the conventional wisdom in Sacramento, and it can be tested by a guy named Seth Mask at the Denver University has collected data on every single roll call vote cast on the, cal on the floor of the California Assembly since 1850. So what I'm going to show you now is a graph that shows that polarization, that distance between the average Democrat and the average Republican that I don't think has ever been shown at the scale of an IMAX before. So, <laughs> so we're going to see it now. We're going to see if that conventional wisdom is right. We're going to see if partisan polarization has been going up in California. Yep. So as you see, it's ebbed and flowed as we've changed our rules of government. But, but since the 1960s, it's been rising, rising, and, and is almost off the charts now. So it's very hard to find anyone in the middle of the spectrum in the legislature. And, and it's very hard to come up with bipartisan deals when two parties need to, to reach agreement in Sacramento. So that's one of the constraints that our government's operating under. And the second, not to be minimized, is that like every state, we're facing a dramatic fiscal crunch caused by uh, the biggest downturn we've seen since the Great Depression. So California revenues actually went down between 2008 and 2009. That hadn't happened since the 1930s. Uh, we're, we're not the state with the biggest fiscal crisis. Just about every state has had that. But what this fiscal crisis has posed is really a stress test for California government to see whether the government that works under the rules we have, the government that works under term limits, uh, the government that works under, under this two-thirds rule to pass a budget, whether it can survive that stress test. 
So let's evaluate how California does when it's just making policy, when it's passing bills that need to get a majority vote in each house of the legislature and then get the governor to sign them. So to test this, I worked with a team of UCSD undergraduates to, to use online search engines to read newspapers. In January, the newspapers of, of California cover what are the big problems facing the state? What's on the agenda of the legislature? And then throughout the year, you can follow their coverage to find out whether the governor and the legislature actually agreed on anything and resolved these policy challenges. And from that, you can get a measure of gridlock. How many of the big problems facing a state were left unresolved by state government in a particular year? I've done, we've done this for the first year of every governor's term, dating back to the 1930s. And the conventional wisdom is that this partisan grit polarization drives that gridlock, and the California government never gets anything done anymore. So we should see gridlock following with this partisan polarization. Do we? No, the dotted line is gridlock, and we see it bouncing up and down. And sure, it was high in the late 80s, uh, but in 1999, Gray Davis actually got a tremendous amount done. Even in, t in 2004, in his first year, Governor Schwarzenegger worked well with both parties in the legislature to, to get a tremendous amount done. Um, the reason for this, I think, is that, is that our normal legislative process doesn't require that partisan gap to be bridged. When you don't need to get both parties to agree on a policy, you don't need, it doesn't matter how far apart they are. The thing that explains this variation, the thing that separates the years of high gridlock from the years of low gridlock, is divided government. When one party controls the governorship and the other party controls the legislature, 20, about, gridlock's about 25% higher in those years. So what this shows is that when Californians want to divide government and, and want to put the brakes on government, they get gridlock. And often you see a year like Gray Davis's uh, years where we lurched very far to the left. You see that responded to by voters electing a new governor, turning over party control, democracy working, and government slowing down the next year. So I think this legislative process is in some ways responsive to voters, but, but clearly has been able to get things done, as we've seen in the, in the glo global climate change and the water examples. Now, the second piece of evidence I'm going to show you on whether our legislative process gets it right comes from a study done by Columbia researchers. They looked at 39 policy areas, and they figured out what voters wanted in each of those policy areas in every state and what state government delivered. And California, actually, came out number one on this. We were the most responsive government, the government that gave the average voter in California the right policy on most of these issues. But we were also, when we were wrong, we were wrong to the left. And we were furthest to the left of any, of any country, of any state in our country. So the, the problem that this creates, the flaw in our, in, our, in our system that this creates, is that we move too far to the left when we, uh, when, when we let the majority simply rule completely unchecked. What happens with the budget process, where you need to get a two-thirds vote? That means you need to bridge the party, party divide. And here's a bit of data that shows you how late our budgets have been, with bars to the right being late budgets, bars to the left being early budgets, uh, how late our budget has been every year. And what you see is our budget process is slow. We have gridlock just about every year, and that gridlock has risen as the parties have grown further apart. You take two people who don't agree, and you have a process that requires them to agree, you're not going to get things resolved quickly. Do we give voters what they want on the budget? Well, in California, uh, we, uh, we can poll on this. We can find out what voters want when there's a budget crisis. Most voters want a mixture of spending cuts and tax increases. And, and what you see uh, coming out of government is, is often that deal. What you saw last year was a budget that resolved uh, the deficit purely through spending cuts. So now that, uh, that we've seen, you know, we, now that we've gotten to this point of partisan polarization, we, we clearly have a budget process that doesn't work, that, that doesn't deliver what the average voter wants. So how should we change these things? So, so my proposal, and I'll, I'll breeze through these quickly, but I'd be happy to get into them more in question and answers, is to try to solve our major problems by balancing what's good and what's bad and giving something to the left and the right with all of these. So I think we should shift to a simple majority to pass the budget. I think we'd get budgets done quickly, and I think they'd resolve, they'd, they'd be shaped in the way that looks like what the average voter wants in California. But at the same time, we could give the minority party a, a bigger voice in California government if we got rid of something called the suspense file, which, kill, which allows the majority to kill minority bills without a vote. So if you got rid of that change, and states have done this before through constitutional amendments, if you got rid of that policy process, Republicans would have a voice in the policy process, it would not be skewed so far left, and the Democratic majority could control the budget process. 
Second change I'd recommend is, is something that would alter term limits, and this will be on your ballot in November, something that would alter term limits to allow voters, uh, legis voters to keep electing someone uh, to the same House over and over again, but not give them any more years in Sacramento. So you don't lengthen the amount of time that anyone can serve in state politics, but instead of making them hop from one House to the other, you leave them in power. And so you won't have what happened with the last uh, economic crisis, right, where we've been trying to write budgets, fix budgets that were written by people who, because of term limits, knew they'd never be in power when the money went away. So they had the ultimate moral hazard, no reason to plan for the future. And then finally, I think voters have a say in this, have, have some, should share some blame in this, because we've passed initiative after initiative that has written checks that, that the legislature ends up having to cash. And one proposal that's probably also headed to your ballot in November would say that, uh, that we should end this ballot box budgeting by saying that every initiative has to say where the money comes from to support it. And this would stop both free spending and tax cutting initiatives that weren't balanced with uh, a fiscally neutral um, way of, of, of figuring out where their price tag comes. Thanks so much. Thank you, Thad. The next speaker will be Isaac Martin. Isaac is an associate professor in sociology. He's the author of The Permanent Tax Revolt, How the Property Tax Transformed American Politics. He is the co-editor of two other books on fiscal policy. His research concentrates on social movements, political sociology, and social policy. And he has published extensively on issues involving taxation and society. Please welcome Isaac Martin. Thank you. Thad has argued that we have two systems of government, really, in California. A majoritarian system for most policy issues that works pretty well, and a kind of consensus-based system for budgeting that works not so well. I'm going to pick up on that second point and pose two questions about that, that consensus-based system for budgeting. First, where did that system come from? And second, why do we stick with it if it's so broken? Why are we stuck with it? Well, the consensus-based system results from two different provisions of our state constitution. And one is the one that, that Thad uh, talked a bit about, and that's that two-thirds supermajority rule for agreeing on a budget, a spending plan in the legislature. And the reason that's in our constitution is that uh, in 1933, it was packaged together with a, a number of provisions to provide tax relief for homeowners who were very angry about heavy property taxes at the time. And, and there was a package of, of tax relief for homeowners and this two-thirds spending rule. And the legislature put them all together and called it the Riley Stewart Amendment and put it on the ballot. Now, voters in 1933 were not especially angry or concerned about legislative voting rules. They were riled up about the property tax. And so they voted yes. The second provision I want to talk about is the 1978 amendment to our Constitution that requires a two-thirds supermajority in both houses of the legislature, not just to agree on a spending plan, but to agree on a tax increase, on any revenue increase that comes from taxes. Uh, this provision is also in our Constitution because of a property tax rebellion, in fact. And like the Riley Stewart Amendment, uh, this budget rule was packaged together with some provisions that provided tax relief for homeowners, and the whole package was put on the ballot. It was called Proposition 13. Voters, again, were not especially uh, exercised about the constitutional rules that the legislature was governed by when it made tax decisions, but they were mad about property taxes, so they voted yes. Now, neither of these supermajority rules actually has anything to do with the property tax, but it's helpful to understand that they originated in homeowners' protests against the property tax, because understanding that fact helps us to explain why it is that they stick, why it is that these supermajority requirements remain in our Constitution today. And for the rest of my talk, I'm going to focus on that supermajority requirement for increasing taxes, the one that we wrote into our Constitution in 1978. Um, it's the more recent addition to our Constitution, and I I think, I, I think it's uh, more directly implicated in, in the present budget crisis. Uh, it's also Proposition 13, and that makes it a lively topic. You probably already have an opinion on Proposition 13. Uh, most Californians do. 
uh, and they're strongly held opinions. An editor of the Sacramento Bee once wrote a book called Paradise Lost, in which he basically argued that Proposition 13 was, was California's original sin. Uh, the more common opinion in California is that Proposition 13 is the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, that, that last opinion is more, more common, as I said, and it, it's important to know that the last opinion is common, that Proposition 13 is popular, and, and here's why. These are polling results from surveys in the last couple of years that have asked people if they'd be willing to change the rules governing tax increases in the legislature from a two-thirds supermajority requirement to permit a simple majority of the legislature increase revenues. And the answer depends on how you ask the question, and that's the, that's the point of the slide. If you simply ask voters in principle, should it be a majority vote, they overwhelmingly say yes. The percentage is somewhere between 62 and 73 percent, depending on what other information voters are exposed to. Uh, if you word it differently and ask about changing the legislative vote threshold needed to raise taxes or pass a budget from two-thirds to a simple majority, Voter support plummets. It's between 38 and 43 percent. Now, one possibility is that people don't like that word change. When you say change the rules, people get nervous. Uh, the linguist George Lakoff, who commissioned the, the particular poll these data come from, thinks it's because we don't like the word taxes. Uh, as it happens, psychologists and behavioral economists have experimental evidence that would support both of those hypotheses. Uh, but the result that's most interesting for my purposes right now is the last one. It's, from a different poll, if you ask people about whether they would change Proposition 13 to lower the threshold for approving taxes to 50 percent, only a quarter of them say yes. Majority rule on revenue decisions? Sure. Uh, change the law so there's majority rule on tax decisions? Maybe, but now you're making me nervous. Change Proposition 13 to make it possible for a majority to raise taxes? No. That seems to be the response. Now, Proposition 13 is extraordinarily popular, and it's so popular that even the mere mention of changing it is enough to get some people to abandon their support for majority rule in budgeting. Uh, pundits commonly say that it's the third rail in California politics, meaning it's that electric rail that if you touch it, you die. And, 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 and by die, they mean um, cause yourself not to get reelected. Uh, and here's why they say that. The slide shows that a majority of adults think Proposition 13 was a good thing. These are all polls from 2008 and 2009. And a majority of voters uh, in a poll on the 30th anniversary of Proposition 13 said they would vote for it, if, again, if it were on the ballot today. But most of these people are probably thinking only about the residential property tax. When you poll people about their willingness to change specific provisions of Proposition 13, the parts that really look like a third rail are the parts that concern the taxation of homes. Would you be willing to change the rule that limits the growth of the property tax? That's what that top bar here is about. That was the, the question. And only 17% said yes. Would you be willing to have your property assessed at market value? This is also a change to Proposition 13, to how it how we would tax property, and only 27% said yes. Would you be willing to change the supermajority voting rules for state taxes and the, a related uh, supermajority voting rule for certain local taxes? Well, as I've showed you, it depends on how you ask, but in at least some wordings, a majority says yes. The property tax limitation is the untouchable part. That's the third rail. Now, why is it so untouchable? Well, in part, this is a simple story of vested interests. Proposition 13 keeps property taxes low even when property values are increasing. It does it by prohibiting local government from measuring the value of property, the market value of property, and taxing it at that value. Instead, real estate can only be reassessed when it changes hands. And that means that during the long housing boom that California experienced, the longer you held on to your home, the more you benefited from Proposition 13. And the more you benefited from Proposition 13, the better you felt about Proposition 13. <laughs> Here's the percentage of people polled on the 30th anniversary of Proposition 13 who said they would vote for it if it were on the ballot today, with a breakdown by how long they'd owned their homes. Only 41% of renters said that they would vote for it. 54% of new homeowners said they would vote for it. These people enjoyed some benefit from Proposition 13, but not yet very much. 
The biggest beneficiaries are the people who've held on to their homes since the 1970s because they haven't had their homes reassessed since the 1970s. And so they're still being taxed on their homes as if those homes were worth what they were worth in the 1970s with a small increment of 2% a year, but not nearly the increment that those houses have actually increased in value. And those folks, unsurprisingly, like Proposition 13 a whole lot because they're the big beneficiaries. Uh, now, in conclusion, I have just four points. First of all, it's, it's, it's that attachment to tax relief for homeowners that really makes Proposition 13 so untouchable. Protection for homeowners is so sacred to California voters that it casts a kind of, a kind of glow, a halo over the other parts of the Constitution that were written in as part of Proposition 13. Uh, second, this attachment, our, our passionate attachment to tax relief for homeowners is rooted in real protection that Proposition 13 gave to homeowners who held on to their homes for a long time during the housing boom. Now, my third point is an implication of these. Uh, we're not in a housing boom now. So right now, the property tax provisions of Proposition 13 are not currently protecting anyone from anything nor are they particularly implicated in the current state budget crisis, since state revenues declined in this recession for reasons having very little to do with the property tax. And my fourth and last point is that the provision of Proposition 13 that is especially implicated in the current budget crisis is that provision that requires two-thirds of the legislature to agree, and that's one that people do not actually find so sacred when you ask them about it on its own. The supermajority rule. If we want to understand why that supermajority rule sticks, it helps to understand that it was written into the Constitution during a property tax revolt. Even today, when you call it by the same name that it had during the property tax revolt, uh, it basks in the light of that borrowed halo. But if we want to understand how that supermajority requirement might come unstuck, it helps to understand that it was kind of a sideshow to the property tax crisis in the 1970s. They were packaged together on the ballot in 1978, but there's no reason why they need to be packaged together. They're not currently linked together in our Constitution. We could change one without changing the other, and we could, in particular, change the supermajority rule without changing the parts of our Constitution and those parts of the Proposition 13 package that are so sacred to California voters. Thanks. Okay. Our next speaker is Marisa Abrahano. Marisa will be an associate professor in political science. Uh, she was just promoted. Uh, her research focuses on American politics, voting, campaigns, and electoral behavior in contexts involving complex demographics of the kind found in California. She's the author of two forthcoming works and is published in many journals. And she'll talk about the role of demographics and the question, are they to blame for California's woes? Please welcome Marisa. Great. Thank you, Jeff. So like Jeff mentioned, the focus of my presentation is to look at whether the changing demographics in the state um, is responsible for the fiscal crisis that we're currently in. And so when I'm talking about demographics, obviously that encompasses a whole range of different um, characteristics, such as age or gender. But specifically today, I will be focusing on the ethnic racial makeup of our population, given that <clears throat> with respect to the budget crisis that we've been facing in the past year and a half, this has been the particular demographic that's received most of the attention. And just to give everybody a brief overview of how much these demographics have changed just in the past 40 years, uh, this is just a very simple graph that shows where we are now from where we were 40 years ago in terms of understanding who comprises our population by this particular characteristic. And so uh, in 1970, as you can see, the majority, almost 75, more than 75 percent of uh, our state's population was comprised of um, non-Hispanic white American voters. And I'm sorry, the population itself, not just voters. And then um, increasingly, within each decade, the share of the population has decreased. And what we've seen is increasingly a larger population of um, Asians and Latinos um, 
in, in our state's population. Um, the rates of African Americans have stayed fairly constant uh, at around 10% um, of the population, but really you can see that the, uh, the um, Latino and the Asian population have become larger and larger chunks of our, of our state makeup. And so um, as of the year 2000, California officially became a majority minority state, which essentially just means that the majority of our population is, was comprised of ethnic and racial minorities. And then here, this last part, um, at the end of the graph shows that by 2050, the majority of our population is going to be uh, comprised of individuals of, of Latino descent. And so the key thing to take away from this graph is that the population growth that we've been seeing w over this time period is mostly due to immigrants from Latin America and Asia, and primarily from Latin America. Now, when we're talking about the immigrant population, oftentimes we generally we generally think of it in terms of uh, their their legal status, and um, that is really where most of the concern has come in terms of as it relates to the budget uh, crisis that we're in. Now, just within California. Um, Within California's immigrant population, actually 70% of the po of the immigrant population are either naturalized uh, citizens or are here in the country legally. With the remaining um, being what is commonly referred to as individuals without any legal status or um, those who are termed to be illegal immigrants. And that's really uh, something that I'm going to talk about a little bit later, which is because that is the particular um, immigrant group that's faced most of the attention um, as it relates to the budget crisis. Now, there's generally two perspectives on um, this demographic change. There's obviously a set of advantages and disadvantages, and I'm sure we can all think of the, the pros and cons that, that come out of this. Now, if we're thinking about the, the, uh, the pros that generate um, from this demographic change. Um, one is that this, this large immigrant influx in particular has the uh, ability to, and is currently doing so, helping to replace the baby boom generation, um, which in other parts of the world is a very big problem because of uh, low population growth. But here in California and in the United States as a whole, this hasn't really been an issue because of, of this immigrant inflow. Um, also, immigrants contribute to the cultural and ethnic diversity of not just our nation, but particularly in California. And so this ranges from you know, all the social dimensions and the cuisine that we have available to us in California, um, as well as the exposure that, uh, that our children receive in schools, as well as um, what we're exposed to um, you know, just at, at the university level as well. And then the third point is uh, that immigrants have been largely responsible in, in, certain, in certain sectors for developing economic growth and innovation. So if you just take Silicon Valley, for example, um, high-skilled immigrants who've, who've contributed to um, the, the uh, high-tech uh, industry boom that we had here in California that was largely led by the immigrant population, but also immigrants um, who don't have those high technical skills um, also have work in areas that, um, that we have a general need a large need in, in this state. So and some areas from agriculture to the service sector, um, we see immigrants filling those positions where we've uh, in other parts of the country, for example, or in, in other countries as a comparative standpoint, have had a great deal of trouble trying to fill those, those particular labor shortages. Now, of course, some of the negative or the uh, disadvantages that have been espoused with this, with this rapid growth in um, the changing demographics, um, and, and this first point is generally the one that's received the most attention, is that these, uh, particularly these immigrant inflows, have posed an e economic burden on state resources. And in particular, this has been um, targeted primarily towards the types of services that immigrants who don't have uh, legal status have been, um, ha have, can have access to. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. But the, the conventional wisdom is that, that this particular group of immigrants poses an economic um, drain to our public resources, especially in, in scarce times like, like we're in right now. Um, 
A second con that's been sometimes raised is that that because primarily some of a large percentage of these immigrant um, populations are uh, tend to have lower socioeconomic backgrounds, that there is this potential to increase crime rates, um, not just at, both at the state and the national level, but. There has been research that's looked extensively at this particular point, and um, to date, there's really been no link showing that in areas with large immigrant populations, um, that there's necessarily a correlation between that and having an increase in, in property crime rates. Also, immigrants have a lower incarceration rate than uh, U.S.-born adults, so it, there is in terms of the actual research to support this claim, there really has been largely unfounded. And then this final point is something that's been discussed and pointed out um, by prominent social scientists such as Samuel Huntington that these immigrants are a threat to our national identity. And in particular, certain immigrant groups have a particularly difficult time uh, integrating themselves into uh, our current um, society relative to immigrant groups of the, the earliest at the turn of the century. And so this is just a broad um, spectrum of where we're seeing this, um, what we've generally seen the conventional wisdom and sort of the public perceptions on this, on this particular issue. So the public's view on this matter as it relates to what we've been talking about tonight is that many have blamed immigrants, especially, like I said, those without legal status for the state's um, budget deficit. And, in, and the two specific things that, that the public has been um, increasingly focused on is that access to public education, either through um, the children of, of, of immigrants without undocumented status, and then access to emergency health care. Okay. Um, if you recall, back in the early 90s, we did pass Proposition 187 uh, that limited this, this access to, um, that would limit access to, for legal immigrants to this type of um, services, but that was overruled um, by the courts as being unconstitutional. And you know it's still up for debate. Largely, co economists have looked at this extensively to see what the exact fiscal impact has been on the spending versus um, the, the net contributions that undocumented immigrants make. And so the, you hear reports still on both sides where essentially some economists have said, well, it, it, it sort of evens out between the contributions and the cost, whereas others have said that this is still um, a large burden that that the state, for example, in California, some estimates have been about four to five billion on, on um, the services that we spend. But like I said, others have disputed those particular numbers, largely because we don't actually, the census, we don't actually keep track of who, people's legal status. So it's very hard to estimate what these true numbers actually are. So then what went wrong and where are we now? Well, as you all know, Immigration is such a delicate issue because it is, it's a federal issue, and it's something that states don't have jurisdiction to, to legislate on. And as we all know, the federal government has not enacted comprehensive immigration reform. They have been trying to do so for several years, but we still don't have one to date. And so this has led to great deals of frustration amongst the public in terms of trying to control, particularly states that have a large immigrant population, to deal with, to deal with particular issues that are, are salient to their population. And so you know, most recently, we've seen Arizona take matters into their own hands and try to enact policy, um, statewide policy, to tackle this issue specifically. And so can this issue be fixed? Well, yes, but the uh, road to immigration reform is not easy. Um, this year alone, the president has already said that it's unlikely that immigration reform is going to, going to be um, brought up in Congress, number one, because it is an extremely sensitive topic that most politicians, particularly in an election year, that they don't want to that they don't want to discuss. And then after the battle with, with health care reform, uh, it's just you know not many don't think it's feasible that that Congress has the stomach to take on another um, issue that's so so controversial. Um, and so then on a re and then on another matter that's not um, in terms of another issue that I wanted to raise was 
when we're talking about these demographic changes as well, uh, the rates of responsiveness and representation are not necessarily the same for all Californians. And what I mean by this is that um, when we're looking at these immigrant populations, their rates of turnout and voting and registration are still far below that of the native population. There's still about a 15 to 20 percent gap in how they turn out and whether or not they turn out to vote. And largely, um, to some extent, that can be explained by the fact that many don't have um, that haven't bothered to go through the citizenship process or, at all, or many are non-voters. And so as politicians, they are not necessarily accountable for that entire segment of the population. Um, and if you think about going back to the first graph that I showed for an increasingly larger and larger share of our population, so um, when we're thinking about questions of representative democracy, uh, those are some sorts of uh, issues that we do need to keep in mind as well. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. The last presenter is Bud Meehan. Bud is professor of sociology. He's also director of UCSD Center for Research and Educational Equity Assessment and uh, Teaching Excellence. Uh, his research over more than three decades is focused on issues in education with particular emphasis on underserved and, uh, populations. He's one of the founders of UCSD's on-campus model charter school, the Preuss School, and has created many partnerships with schools in the local community. He's published six books, received four teaching awards, and has received uh, a number of the profession's most prestigious prizes and awards. Please welcome Bud Meehan. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. All right, good. I want to start with a proposition, and that is that public education is a public good and that the current budget crisis that we're all facing has the great potential to erode, if not further erode, the commitment that we have made for over a century to public education. What do I mean by a public good? A public good is that entity which suggests that we all benefit from that activity if we contribute to it a little bit as citizens, even though we may not have a particular direct benefit. So we have education as a public good, even if I don't have children in school at the present time. The idea is that I benefit as a citizen because everybody else is getting better educated and is more likely to make decisions that are rational as a result of that education process. And what I fear is a consequence of this budget crisis is that we'll have a further division between rich and poor. We'll, have, we'll undercut the value of a public education. And so those people who are able to afford education in an environment that is increasingly unequal will be able to benefit from it, whereas other members of the, the citizenry will not. And part of the reason for that is that we have asked schools, public schools in particular, to do lots of things, to educate citizens to be more knowledgeable, to try to break down the gaps between rich and poor or members of different religious, religious or ethnic groups. And those deep-seated commitment to public education in the common school have, could be eroded even further if the budget crisis that we're living with continues. Part of this is a function of the way in which public education is funded. The basic idea is that public schools are funded based on tax dollars. In, in California, it's basically the property tax and money goes up to the state and is reallocated and there's a very complicated formula uh, involved in that. But as a result of that, there is a redistribution of funds to different school districts, and depending upon the property tax value of the district, there can be an uneven distribution of tax dollars. There is, in fact, additional money that comes to, to districts from the federal government by for certain kinds of impact funds, if there's a lot of military living in a neighborhood, or if there are many special education students or English language learners, districts indeed do get extra federal funds. But in general, there's an imbalance across districts. And again, I worry that the current budget crisis will make that even worse. So let me now call your attention to California's funding uh, disaster. That 
At the current time, and the, and the estimates vary almost daily, if you check the newspapers or the radio uh, the, or the television, the, the amount of money being uh, seen to be a shortfall varies between 18 and $26 billion. And the K-12 sector, which is what my, the main topic of my conversation, has been cut each year over the last several years. And there's a guess that the accumulated effect will be well over uh, $12 billion. And if we bring this to a closer, a little bit closer to home, looking at the largest school district in our neighborhood, the San Diego Union School District, San Diego City Schools, which is one of the largest in the state and indeed the nation, there has been, they have experienced a 14% decrease in funding for each pupil. So if you go back to the, 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 the column on the extreme left, 2007, 2008, on average, there was almost $6,000 per student being spent by the state, and that's dropped down considerably to about 4,700 projected for the next year, on average. Now, to be sure, elementary school students are are benefited at a lower rate than high school students because presumably high school students require more resources in terms of laboratory equipment, athletic equipment of the sort, but that's an average. And what that does is bring California down precipitously close to the bottom of all states in the United States in terms of, of um, uh, funding committed to education. Ed California used to be proud for being one of the top states in the union in terms of per, per pupil expenditure. We're now either fourth or fifth from the bottom, uh, wrestling with states like Mississippi and Alabama uh, for that honor or dishonor. What are the consequences of this budget cut? Already, significant educators in the K-12 sector have been laid off and others will continue to be laid off. And this is a particularly precarious issue because the teachers who are laid off are often the newest teachers to join the school system. Working on the principle of the most recent hired becomes the last the, I'm sorry, the most recent fired is the, fir the first person hired is the first to be uh, fired, right? That's, the, that's the, the principle I'm trying to associate. And principals of schools, including folks from Lincoln High School who are here today, will often tell you that the teachers who have come to them more recently, so-called probationary teachers, are better equipped, more enthusiastic, better able to identify with an increasingly diverse population than the veterans who have been in the school system for a long period of time. So energetic principles of that sort are faced with a dilemma that the very teachers they'd like to keep will be taken away from them because those are the teachers that have to be eliminated. An obvious consequence of that is that class size will increase. If you dim diminish the number of teachers, but the number of students stays constant, there are more kids per classroom. In addition to teachers, although they're certainly the most important element in a school, other personnel like school nurses, counselors, lunchroom aides, assistant principals, the people who take care of the landscaping, they too are being eliminated. In fact, in order to protect the core of the classroom, they are being eliminated first. But that wider social support system is essential uh, in order to keep students learning and learning well. Another thing that we're seeing in schools is that elements of education that are considered not at the core, enterprises such as music, art, physical education, including drama, are being cut so that the core subjects of math and English will be retained. Now, just a, a, another, another relationship uh, being brought to the city schools, this slide just shows the, number, the total number of, of employees dropping over the last several years and the number of teachers dropping, even though the, the number of students has stayed the same or slightly increased. Now, what can be done about this? You've heard eloquently from my colleagues how we've gotten to the situation, what the difficulties are. What I would like to do is just mention briefly two sets of solutions, some of which have been proposed already. So in a sense, this is a summary statement. But in addition, I'd like to bring other possibilities to your attention. For, and I'd like to divide them up, those solutions, into two categories, institutional possibilities and fiscal possibilities. On the institutional side, I guess the first comment I would like to make is that there's a discussion in, in balancing a budget. Either, there's two ways to balance a budget, and we know this from our own checkbooks. You can either cut back on expenses, spend less money, 
Or you can add money to that checkbook. You can add revenue to, uh, uh, the, the, to the checkbook and to the stream of funding that we have available. Over the last several years in our state, the only way in which we've been talking about balancing a budget is by making deep and significant cuts. You've heard eloquent statements today about other possibilities, and I'm gonna add some more. But what I think is that the people who are defending the public good, the idea that education is something that benefits each and every one of us as citizens, even if we don't have a, a child in school at the present time, have not done a very good job of educating all of us about the benefits of our tax dollars, what our tax dollars do. So it's my hope that the expertise of the, my colleagues tonight, plus the constitutional discussions that are going around the state, will tilt that balance in such a way that discussions about adding revenue or making constitutional changes will become part of the public discourse. Now that's not, not neither of the, the fiscal changes nor the institutional changes are likely to happen in a moment, but this is entering the conversation. It's beginning the conversation. So again, some of the topics that you've already heard tonight, a discussion of Proposition 13, the need to perhaps modify that provision in such a way that tax re revenue can be distributed and allocated to schools and other public services in a more equitable way. You've also heard discussions of the, the problems uh, brought to our attention by the two-thirds supermajority requirement to deal with issues of governance and budget. That is a possible uh, necessity to be modified through time. One that was not discussed, but something that impacts public education is the criminal justice system. We have a very, very restrictive three strikes law in our state that requires the incarceration of people for serious felonies. But also the way in which the three strikes law is written, people can have more minor crimes as part of those three strikes than in it, that, that, that sends them to prison for an extended period of time. One possibility is to examine that issue very closely and perhaps make modifications of the way in which the, the prison system operates so that people who are engaged in considerably more minor crimes would not be kept in prison for extended periods of time. And it's, all, it's well known that you can actually stay at a, at a first-rate hotel and put prisoners in a first-rate hotel more cheaply than the current, present the current prison situation allows. And it's certainly much more expensive to incarcerate prisons than it is to educate our students in California. So that brings me to some fiscal possibilities. The idea, and this is a very hard issue to deal with in our troubled times, adding revenue in order to balance the budget instead of deepening uh, uh, the cuts. Possibilities include uh, tax possibilities, one of which is the oil extraction tax. That is to say, California is a state that does not demand that people who are taking oil out of the ground pay a tax to the state. By contrast, two of the most socialist states in the United States, Texas and Alaska, under George W. Bush when he was governor of Texas and Sarah Palin when she was governor of, of Alaska, imposed an oil extraction tax. So if California might learn something in that respect. Uh, sin taxes are also always a popular way of, of dealing with uh, income. It's possible to increase uh, the taxes on alcohol, cigarettes, and other substances. And I'll discuss what that means if you wish. <laughs> Th that is already mentioned, and Isaac, in fact, all, all of my colleagues have mentioned that if you approach the voters on taxation in a particular way, voters are likely to consider the possibility of being taxed. One of them that's interesting that's being considered in the city right now, city of San Diego, is a parcel tax, a tax on a, pro a parcel of land that would go exclusively for education. These are taxes that are not going into the general coffers, but go for very specific reasons. The polling data shows the that, that voters are willing to be taxed for those kind of considerations if they know where the, inf the money is going, and it is immediate and can be used within their local activities. In fact, the city of San Diego, with Proposition S and Proposition MM over the last several years, have demonstrated their willingness to be taxed when they can see the benefit for them. 
So it's my suggestion that these kind of issues need to be discussed, and it's important that an audience such as this begin that conversation so that we perhaps balance the budget in ways that are not completely draconian, and also we engage in institutional reforms that will take a couple of years, but that will bring California back to the top of the states in terms of progressivism and not at the bottom where we reside now. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please join me in thanking the panelists. It's been a very good presentation. I hope you've enjoyed it.